Hello, Chicago. I wanted to begin with a moment of gratitude. I would like to thank the CUSP conference for being so kind as to invite me. I would also like to thank my parents. I was born only on the other side of the street, on the south side of this museum. And my parents have、uh, fostered a life of art, design, materials, and nature. And all of those factors play heavily in my work. I would like to thank my、uh, client of 20 years, Wilson Art. A lot of designers think that they make a difference in a project, and indeed they do, they contribute. But without an awesome client, us in the design world are nothing. And above all, I'd like to thank you, dear audience, because I am here for you. My talk today is called Man Made Natural, and I'm here today to talk to you about the authenticity of materials. What does that mean? I'm here to talk about the difference between real and Man made. So, truth to materials is one of the great tenets of design and architecture. Truth to materials is a term that was coined by John Ruskin in his book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, in the 1880s. And we, in design, pretty much have lived by it ever since. Truth to materials talks about the appropriate use of materials and it promotes natural and pure materials over those which are synthetic, imitative, or man made. But having spent many years looking at materials, I have to ask. Is this thinking accurate? Is it useful? Does it serve us? Is it relevant? What do we really need to know about this issue and materials today? So, I'm going to start with a little exercise here. I'm going to show a series of images, and I would like you to please notice how you react. This is really like a Rorschach test for you. Do you have any reactions? Do you have any preferences? Do any words come to mind? Any anecdotes? I noticed something interesting that, in general, people do not like man made materials that imitate materials found in nature. Now, we call these imitations or simulations. There is an innate bias in our culture, not just design culture, in our culture in general, against anything imitative. And this is what I'm here to talk about specifically today man made materials that imitate materials found in nature. If we don't like fake, why does fake exist? Right? Why have we not eradicated it like polio or the whooping cough?、Right? And it seems to not only still exist, it's like more common now than ever. So, why? Does it serve a purpose? Is it useful in some way? And if it does serve a purpose, what is it? Let's examine what we mean by fake and real. I love etymology and the history of words, it tells us so much about ourselves. So, the word fake comes from the Latin. Which means to spruce up by artificial means. I put all the words that are synonyms with fake, artificial, yada, yada, and words started popping out. And I noticed that art, artifice, and artificial all have the word artem at their root. Now, artem means to make. Copy, copious, and cornucopia have copia, which means abundance at its root. So the initial idea of faking something. Is a lack of something. It's a response to a lack of something. And it's basically not, I'm trying to fool you or sell you a cheap bill of goods that looks like something else. Really, so much of the intention behind imitation is you have that. I like that. I want one. But there's not another one. So I have to kind of coddle together something that looks like that. And I think about this a lot in terms of food, right? We all hate GMOs. But a lot of the intention that made GMOs occur in the first place was trying to feed more people, right? I think of the politics behind something like golden rice. Simply to feed more people and feed more people in a more nutritious way. So it wasn't about deceit, it was about making more. It was about abundance. That's at the root of this artificialness. So, what is real? So, real means comes from nature, born of the universe. Devoid of the activity of humans. Fake means the hand of man was involved, and real means no hand of man was involved whatsoever. One of the most important things that you will leave my talk thinking, and I hope you do question this as you go out there into the world, is what is nature? What is nature? Where does it exist? And what is our actual relationship with it? Not our idealized relationship, but the actual relationship with it. So I'm going to show you another pair of images. Can anybody here tell me? The difference between a caribou and a reindeer. 
That's good too. So I, I um, through Wilson Art, I teach a chair class that I've taught. It's a sponsored corporate class where we, I teach chair design in a different school in a different part of the country each year. I was at Appalachian State University and there was this angelic little girl sitting right here who raises her hand. Now, nobody's ever raised their hand during these pictures, so I said, yes, and what would the difference be? And she says, caribou are more delicious. <laughs> I said, do you know this from experience? She says, yes. I'm like, okay, well, I can't argue with that. So apparently caribou are more delicious. But the way I learned was that the difference between a caribou and a reindeer is a fence. And the caribou lives on that side of the fence, and the reindeer lives on this side of the fence. So in essence, a reindeer is a domesticated caribou. But here is the difference, people. When we domesticate animals, we change their DNA. So the genome of a caribou and the genome of a reindeer are different. So the differences cannot necessarily be seen with the human eyes. This is very important to consider because we're judging this real, fake, natural, man-made with a different metrics than what we should be using. At what point does the hand of man make nature no longer nature? At what point do we transform it entirely? What is that spectrum? A lot of my audience is people in the architecture and interior design communities, and I love it when they tell me, this wood came from a tree farm. Right? This is an exotic species of wood, but it's okay because it came from a tree farm. I like to point out to them, have you ever seen a tree farm? Okay, this is what a tree plantation looks like. I will point out that the trees are conveniently planted so a harvesting device can easily roll between them, and the trees themselves have been genetically modified to not have cross branches so they can be more easily processed. And what happens is we've, as humans, have replaced a biodiverse environment with a monoculture. So none of the animals, none of the birds, none of the insects that lived there originally have a home anymore. And this is the shocking part about tree plantations, is that when you read the UN statistics on reforestation globally, they include tree plantations. So these are qualifying as forests. Is this a forest to you? According to the UN, it's legally a forest. When you look at the statistics of the top reforesting countries in the world, China's number one, this is what they're planting. So what is truly natural? And I'm here today to point out that, to me, that which is truly natural is that which has had the least intervention by human activity, those places in the world that humans have yet to really overrun. And those are the places that are most worth preserving, that are most precious to us. So I show you two examples. One is a primeval forest that is a forest that has never been logged. There is no nation on the planet that has more than 7% of their old growth forests left. My home state of New York, where I live now, I guess my home state technically is Illinois, but my home state of New York has less than 3% of their original forests left. Not their original land mass cover, but forest cover. It's a different statistic because it's less. And that 3% represents things like the side of mountains where humans couldn't figure out how to log the trees out of there. That's why we have what we have. On average, there's no state in the United States that has more than 3% of their old growth forests. And I show you the North American Plains bison, and you're probably saying, oh, Grace Jeffers. Ted Turner has like 100,000 of those. And indeed, he does. But all of his bison are crossbred with beef cattle. They're technically beefalo. Sadly, that's not actually funny. <laughs> There's only one herd of genetically pure wild bison left in the world, and that is the Yellowstone herd. There's less than 4,000 of them, and the state of Montana slaughtered 819 of them in the months of January, February, and March in this year. If you would like to see a very interesting cause, this animal should be on the endangered species list. If you think about it, there's 85,000 African elephants. They're on the endangered species list, but 4,000 North American plains bison are not. It's indicative of the power of the cattle and the sheep industries because this is essentially a grass war. They don't want the animals to roam outside of Yellowstone. They want grazing rights in Yellowstone. So there's this artificial war going on over the bison. Unfortunately, they're dying as a result of it. The Buffalo Field Campaign is a great organization. That where you can go and learn more about this issue. And every time I give this talk, I do the only thing I can do, which is I talk about it and I give money. So 
Thank you for having me, because they'll get a check as a result of this. This is what is worth saving. I heard a Peruvian shaman tell me once that to cut down the forest is to burn libraries before the books have been read. Remember Alexandria? Is that not one of the greatest moments of the burning of the Mayan codices? One of the greatest moments of loss of human civilization? We're doing the same thing with these remaining forests left on the planet. I've also heard of forests that they hold the answers to the questions we've yet to ask. The, the amounts of medicines and information that is derived from forests, from deep forests, is really important to us, to the future of our species. And yet these forests are not being preserved for those reasons. I put up this slide because I say to you, welcome to the desert of the real. For those of you that are Matrix fans, I'm sure you remember after Morpheus gives the big reveal that we're living in the matrix, that's what he says. The desert of the real is a phrase coined by the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard, who in 1981 published a book called Simulacra and Simulation. And for those of you Matrix fans, Morpheus carries a first edition copy of Simulacra and Simulation in his trench coat pocket. The idea of the desert of the real is that we live in a world of mass production. There is no one original podium from which all these podiums came. It's like everything was made to be made in multiples. Our food, our furniture, our clothing. It's never really intended to be just one. This platonic idea of the original is obsolete. So I'm saying to you, it's not that we're entering a time of the matrix, we're already deep in it. We already live in a world that is so adulterated by human activity that this idea of pure and natural and real and fake is nostalgia. It's antiquated and irrelevant. What is the most common material that used to be harvested in nature and now is made in a factory? Oh, that's good. Who said that? You're the first person to ever say sugar. That's really good. I love it. No, that's not what I'm going to say. <laughs> Was there one other? Cotton. I love that you said that. I'm going to say no, but I do love that you said that because people, like, they think cotton's pure. They don't understand it's one of the most genetically modified plants on the planet, and it takes 17 springs of pesticides to harvest um, cotton. So, yeah, I, I've questioned the realness of cotton many times. But... No, I'm going to suggest here it is color. So everything we're standing on, everything around us, everything we're wearing was dyed with aniline dye. Originally, all dyes came from plants and minerals. In 1854, a very clever British chemist was trying to invent quinine, and he accidentally invented aniline dye in the color purple, which happened to have been the single most expensive dye stuff in the world. Purple was derived from a small sea snail, and it took about 30 pounds of these snails to dye one pound of fabric. That's why when you see the emperor or royal purple, or when you see the paintings of Christ as king, he has a purple robe. That's why, because it was ungodly, unfathomably expensive to create the color purple. So this guy makes synthetic dye that's color fast, light proof, derived from coal tar, readily manufactured, easily reproduced, in the most expensive color in the world, within 10 years, he became one of the wealthiest men on the planet. 1854, he invents aniline dye. 1856, the British government enacts laws controlling the use of aniline dye in food. 1856. I grew up with Lando Lakes butter. I have to preempt this because now I have all these food savvy people who come to these lectures. And when I ask this question, what color is butter, people? Half of them say white now because they're having stuff, <laughs> because they're eating whipped butter or whatever. But in general, the sticks of butter that you buy are yellow. Butter's been colored yellow since 18, somewhere between 54 and 56. Butter it comes from milk. Milk is white. Butter is yellow because it is dyed that way. So when margarine was developed out of the need for food substitutes during the food rations of the First and Second World War, margarine is white. They had to color it yellow to imitate butter to be more pleasing to the customers. The oldest man-made material that imitates a material found in nature is Egyptian blue, another color. Egyptian blue is an interesting material. It's derived from copper, and the Egyptians used it. They made bricks of it. They would grind it. They used it for glazes. They used it in solid form. That's the faience figure of the Sphinx on the lower left slide. And they used it in painting. 
They used it as a pigment, 5,000 years. It comes from the fourth dynasty in Egypt. And the other thing that's very interesting about Egyptian blue, it imitated lapis and turquoise. They knew it. They used the same words as lapis and turquoise to describe it. And it cost exactly the same as the real material. And when you look at that funerary mask of Tutankhamun, they have real lapis and real turquoise juxtaposed with glass that imitates lapis and turquoise shows you the value they put on this. Lighting, 1840s European cities are illuminated with gas light. 1870s, the incandescent bulb is invented. For the first 30 years it is available, it is called artificial sunshine. And I have to ask you, has anybody here eaten at a, rest, a food place called Subway Sandwiches? <laughs> Somebody's got to fess up here, okay? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hands. Okay, okay, all right, oh, now the hands come up. Since I can see you more clearly, was there anything that may have enticed you to come into Subway? Like you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, Subway, I'm going to go in there. The smell. the smell. And what was that smell? Freshly baked yeasty bread. And when you went into Subway, were they indeed baking fresh bread? No. No. Well, why do you think that is, sir? Because they have a small machine and a super patented corporate fragrance that was created for them by FFI in New Jersey, Fragrance and Flavors International, that emits the scent of freshly baked yeasty bread. And now the new Dunkin' Donuts rollout has their signature fragrance, they wanted one too, of fresh baked bagels. So fragrance, you go into a department store, I'm sure I'm not the only one who spent $100 for a bottle of luxury fragrance. 99.8% of those ingredients are synthetically derived in a lab. They have nothing to do with all the thing, all the lovely ingredients I saw in the pictures. The first fully synthetic fragrance was developed by Guerlain, the luxury French fragrance manufacturer. In 1888, it was called Jicky. So we've been faking perfume for a long time. So now that I've terrified you and you're gonna walk around going, everything is fake, I can't trust anything, natural means nothing, I'm here to inform you that to fake is indeed natural. We are a species hardwired to fake. It's called mimicry. And neuroscientists have actually proved that mimicry is strongest in humans of any species, and it's how we survived as a species. We don't want to do it, we hate it, we want the natural thing, we want the real thing, but we can't help ourselves. So we're a species in conflict, really. Part of it is because humans are interesting in that we have both predator instinct and prey instinct in us. We predate on animals, and animals predate on us. So we have both instincts within us. And if you've ever noticed, when you look at the nature shows and there's like, I'm a zebra and I'm watching that lion and I don't trust that lion because you're looking all chillax there, but you can jump up and run over and kill me in an instant. And there's that wariness and the lion knows to use the camouflage of being chill as a hunting technique. Don't mind me, I'm just sitting here relaxing, but I can spring to life in a second and kill you. So we've learned to use it and like it and employ it, but fear it at the same time. It's interesting, the word funny, which we think of now as being like humorous, funny, ha ha, the original meaning of the word funny meant not quite right. Right, so that wolf in sheep's clothing or that milk that's been in the refrigerator way too long, not quite right. Any of us who've been in therapy know we role modeled everything our parents taught us and anything we just observed, right? Because we're like little sponges and we would mimic it. Why don't monkeys have ballet? Right? Like primates are so skilled at so many things because they don't mimic as much as we do. There was a study done on humans, uh, humans and chimpanzees. You know, all good stories start with a human and a chimpanzee. A little box and a treat and a mallet that had to be tapped on the table, the side of the box, top of the box, side of the box, side of the table. And then you could get the treat. Well, the chimp figured out in no time it could just throw away the mallet and grab the treat. The human would forego eating the treat to perfect the tapping. Right? Now think about ballet. It's that repetition, repetition. Animals don't like repetition, right? That's why horses and dogs are hard to train. But humans, we repeat. Man, that's what we love. We love repetition. Instead of seeing materials, we don't have language complex enough to really describe the real material reality. So instead of seeing things as the polarized argument of real and fake, we should see them as more of a spectrum. This is what the spectrum of materials looks like in terms of board. And really what we're talking about is from least processed, more processed, more processed, more processed. Then you start replacing with other materials. So then you have substitutions and replacements 
of other materials. This is the spectrum of materials. So instead of thinking of things in that polarized, real or fake, let's think about it more like this. Is it wild? Is it a wild tree from a forest? Is it a wild species of tree from an unsilvicultured forest, an unmanaged forest? Is it a cultivated tree? Is it a genetically modified tree species that came from a tree farm? Or is it the fully synthetic replacement, right? Is it natural? Is it semi-synthetic? Is it fully synthetic? Is it an untreated diamond? Is it a diamond that's been treated to have the cracks filled in to make it appear as a higher grade of diamond? Or is it the fully man-made cubic zirconia? And I show you this image because don't we think it a little bit differently between somebody who's had a single breast loss to a mastectomy who gets a restoration job just to have, you know, an even pair versus somebody who gets a, a vanity breast job. It's different, right? So we should talk about it thus so. So I had this epiphany that here we go running around saying in the A&D community, the architecture and interior design, oh, I hate fake materials. I'm not going to use fake materials. My client hates fake materials. And I was like, you know what, people? Sometimes the fake stuff is a better solution. Sometimes fake is the answer. Who here would upholster a chair and tiger? No one. That's what I thought. Now, why wouldn't you upholster a chair and tiger? <laughs> why? Is it not cool? Because tigers are endangered, right? Tigers are an endangered species. However, did you know there are tree species that are just as endangered as tigers? So when Rem Koolhaas and the Office of Mobile Architecture designed that two-foot half-pipe in the Prada flagship store in Soho and they did it in zebra wood, it was equivalent to lining the store in tiger. That's how endangered zebra wood is. So if you want to look at something, you don't know if it's endangered, what do you do? You go online to the CITES list, which is governed by the UN. It is the legally binding list of endangered flora and fauna worldwide. And if you email me at grace at gracejeffers.com, I will share with you my cheat sheet on how to monitor for yourself what's happening with global forests and endangered species. 35% of all tree species on the planet are threatened or endangered. These are critically endangered species. Rosewood, mahogany, wenge. It sounds like I'm shopping at Barney's, doesn't it? Anagray, which is another one. And then you can have a non-endangered tree species from an endangered forest. So that's why Lumber Liquidators was fined $13 million for the oak they had from the Siberian rainforests. Used any of these lately? 80% of all the wood used in the production of disposable wooden chopsticks and Europly, this is not domestic made Europly, this is European made Europly, 80% of it is illegally logged. So I had this epiphany looking at manufacturer's line, I was looking at teak and I said, do you know what's happening with teak? And I explained to them that there's no teak on the planet that doesn't have blood on it, right? We talk about blood diamonds, teak is the same thing. If you look at what happens with the global trade of teak. And I had this epiphany. I'm like, what if we could use the fake thing and keep the wild thing in the wild? At first, I thought that was crazy. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, nope, we're actually, it's already happening. It's already a strategy that's employed. I show you Taxol, which is the anti-cancer drug. Taxol was derived from the bark of the Pacific yew tree, FDA approved in 1967. What happened? People went into the forest, stripped the bark off the trees, and sold them to pharmaceutical companies. The population of the Pacific yew crashed. 1970 the FDA approves uh, synthetically derived taxol, and today we have the U stands that we have in the wild because of synthetic taxol being approved. Plastics? Plastics were invented by the British billiards industry in the 1880s, saw the African elephant populations crashing because everybody wanted a billiard table, a piano, hair combs and toothbrushes. All those items were made with elephant ivory. They wanted a synthetic substitute for elephant ivory. They had a 10,000 pound competition. John Wesley Hyatt invented celluloid, the first plastic, and that was used as the first substitute for billiard balls, for elephant ivory and billiard balls. So plastics began as a solution, even though we are all commonly think it's a problem today. So artificial leather today has been reframed as vegan leather or cruelty-free leather. When I arrived in Chicago, I went to Nima Marcus, is right next to my hotel, and there, right in front of the Bottega Veneta bags are all the Stella McCarthy handbags. Like, there's not a bag under $600. None of it's real leather. It's all, she's a lifetime vegan. She only uses vegan leather in the design of her products. So man-made materials can be more consistent, a controlled resource, more standardized, easier to maintain, more durable, more formable, more readily available, 
more easily replaced, and God forbid, they might be less expensive. So I challenge you in the design community, what, stories, what new stories will you tell with materials? And if you come up with some good ones, I hope to God you share them with me. Thank you so much, dear audience, for your time.